Hello, good afternoon, good evening. We were testing, we thought this mic was not working, but it does, so uh, you will be able to, help, to hear us. Very quickly, here we have the main characters. I will introduce them in a second. First of all, we have here two speakers uh, and a moderator. Thank you very much for being here and I hope you enjoyed. There are many options, not only architecture, we will also be discussing art and so on, so please have a look at the program. Thank you so much, Anna. As Anna was saying, this is the first session of Cosmograph, and if you have the agenda, you will see uh, what the next ones will be, and they all have this feminine gaze. We have two architects with us today, Zaira Mushi and Franziska Ullmann. I'm sorry if I'm not uh, pronouncing your name correctly, but we do what we can. Zaira Mushi is an architect, and she teaches uh, urban planning at uh, the University of Barcelona School of Architecture. She's been the director of uh, Environment and Public Ways and Civicism at Santa Coloma de Gravanet uh, between 2015 and 2019. She's also a specialist in architecture, gender architecture and town planning. She actually taught me at a master's course in 2008 and we really had great fun at that time. And she's a specialist, as I said, in gender uh, urban planning, and she's helped in cities such as Sao Paulo or Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. She's been the president of juries at uh, the Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in Latin America, and she's also been the author of uh, several books, uh, one of them in collaboration with Jose Maria Montané, another, another one called Politic, Politics and Architecture, and so on. And we also have Franziska Ullmann. She comes from Austria, from Vienna. She was born in Vaden, uh, close to Vienna. I, um, I tried, but I'm sure that... Yes, uh, yes, it's a dis at a distance like Manresa and Barcelona. She studied architecture at the Technology University in Vienna in 1975. She's an architect and a teacher. She has uh, many different and varied uh, interests, such as uh, town planning, urbanism, uh, the defense of uh, women's rights, archaeology, and theorization on uh, architectural space. Uh, so as you can see, she discusses many different topics. Thank you very much for being here and for coming to Manresa. And today we start this cycle and uh, we will be talking about feminist urbanism placing lives at the center. So, Zaida, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much. I don't know if uh, Francisca would like to listen to the translation. In, you need to put this in your ears so that you can hear the translation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Cosmograph and the City of Manresa for their invitation. It's a pleasure to be sharing this panel with Claudina and with Francisca. My intention is to give you a theoretical framework of what it means to talk about gender, gendered urban planning or feminism applied to the city. There are similar things, they are not exactly the same. And we could say that gender is a methodology we can apply to an, uh, analyzing cities to create more inclusive and fair cities. And feminism is, of course, a philosophical, political position. It's a way of being in the world that considers that women and men need to be equal. And in many ways, we're still not equal, but we are wherever we position ourselves if we want more egalitarian and fairer cities we need to look at the, the cities from a gender perspective to understand uh, the structural inequalities of our societies and cities and i will try to explain this a little bit when we talk about gender we're not talking about sex we're talking about roles roles that have been allocated to men and women and which are different it doesn't mean that we are not fortunately a little bit more mixed nowadays and there are men who carry out tasks which traditionally were as assigned to the feminine uh, gender and women have always been in the masculine world uh, which is the public space uh, and paid work but we have not been visible there and the construction of our imaginary as a society is exemplified in these images where we see the creation of this inner world which is invisible from the outside where we see these tasks which are not seen from a neutral gaze uh, which is in fact the neutral gaze that uh, shapes uh, urban planning uh, and uh, politics which is what is done in our patriarchal system but women have been working forever although these are invisible types of work and paid types of works and uh, in manresa a city with so many factories uh, women were part of the labor force of industrialization and they were very important but they were never considered to be part of this productive world this construction this invisibilization of women and diversities uh, one could think that maybe in a traffic light we could have the shape of a man because, uh, well, uh, this was done with a plate, but now this is done with with, with LED lights, uh, uh, LED lights, and this could change uh, any minute. And, uh, well, now, for instance, here we have uh, the cover of uh, a magazine. Why do we do this? Uh, we could change this digitally so quickly. Why don't we think about diversity? Why don't we think whenever we look at diversity in a city, the more the more diversity is, the more appropriate it will be for everyone. And I always like to think about a book by Jane Jacobs, uh, 1951. I know it's 60 years ago that a woman according to the urban uh, planning director of the time in new york nobody was against uh, his work but just a bunch of mothers who didn't like what he was doing and a group a bunch of mothers uh, means no one but this woman wrote a seminal book for urban planning which is entitled life and death of big cities and if we need to summarize what the main ideas in this book were we could say that one of them is that urban planning needs to be built around lived experiences and another idea is that cities are complex systems she said that cities could not be solved with a simple equation when all sciences as civil moholinagi said later Urban planning is not science, Clara Grid agreed 20 years ago. It's not a science. Urban planning is not a science in the sense that 
science is more certain. It can repeat a set of formulae and uh, they will turn out again. But societies are not like that because they are made up by persons and persons don't always act in the same way. So we need to think about the cities and urban planning from a perspective of complexity. And then another thing that is so obvious, but if it were so obvious, uh, we would not have this urban sprawl or these social and territorial segregations we suffer at the moment around the planet and so on. If we were to place people at the center of urban and public policies, in this case, urban policies, uh, which is a topic at hand. This is taken from Eva Kyle. Uh, urban planner from Vienna. I don't know if Francisca will use this, but at least uh, it is very telling. It explains what uh, gender mainstreaming wants uh, from urban planning. Mm, planning. We want fairer and more egalitarian cities, and that's why we want cities where short distances are essential, complemented with a sustainable mobility in order to achieve equity in access to opportunity and in the right to a city. But my apologies, this is in Spanish and not in Catalan, but it's important to understand that uh, gender mainstreaming in urban planning and architecture does not mean that we need to find urban, sorry, uh, practical results. It is better, of course, to have a three meter sidewalk than a narrower sidewalk or to have more light than less. But it's a, it's a way of understanding the idea that we are diverse. We need to work together and we need to cater for diversity if we want to create good projects. And these are processes. Uh, urban planning is not a finished thing, but it's an ongoing process and it needs to be based on this different gaze, asking questions in a different questions in a different way to find different results, different answers. Our daily life is what we need to place in gender, gender mainstreamed urbanism. People's lives are made up by four spheres. Hannah Arendt talked about three, the sphere of work, the sphere of labor, meaning the sphere of community, social and political community, and we need to add our own sphere. But our world is basically based on this productive sphere, this productive circle and everything. I'm sorry, I'm getting mixed up with languages because I'm still thinking in English. Well, the productive sphere seems to invade everything and we seem to, we need to adapt cities to the uh, uh, to the priorities of our personal life which go beyond productive life because daily life is made up by four spheres the productive sphere everything that has to do with jobs and with paid work the reproductive sphere which are all those activities necessary for the reproduction of life such as uh, uh, doing housework, uh, caring for the elderly, for children, everything that our system has never valued and has never taken into account because either it is not seen, it is not paid, it is not considered. And here, let me open a small parenthesis because Cristina Carrasco from the University of Barcelona in 2011 created the satellite, satellite accounts in Catalonia and she calculated the percentage of the Catalan GDP that uh, reproductive tasks mean and it, they accounted for 38% of the Catalan GDP. So imagine how big the weight of reproductive tasks tasks is in the uh, Catalan GDP. So if we live in this economics based uh, society, we also need to take into account uh, the tasks of reproductive uh, activities because they save us a lot of money and we need to take care of that too. So, androcentric design and planning can easily be seen in the urban space, which is the scenario of inequalities. It reproduces inequalities and through uh, the shaping of cities, we see a reproduction of the roles and hierarchies that exist in society. Because what is the real space uh, that pedestrians have in sidewalks? Because look at uh, sidewalks, if they're full of things, uh, that means that uh, there is no room for 
that many people here we have enough space for two people walking but what happens if someone comes with a stroller for instance uh, in the other direction who is uh, taking care of uh, changing nappies in public uh, toilets uh, a lot could be said about public toilets by the way what kind of mobility is prioritized uh, in the city who is walking in cities who is riding bicycles who drives cars in the cities he uses uh, who uses public transport how accessible public spaces are because if you build uh, stair grounds, staircases uh, uh, that have no signs uh, for instance or these chairs looking at the wall when chairs are chairs and benches in the city are essential because they are autonomy tools they are not only useful to look at a nice landscape or to spend a little t bit of time but um, they are useful because people who are walking with children or have some kind of disability or have some temporary disability are using benches and and chairs in public spaces to be able to go further because they can take a short rest and then move on so what do we look what do we want uh, when we talk about gender mainstreaming we want to place caring at the center without caring nothing else can exist because there could be no productive work unless somebody looks after and take care takes care of people and then the sexed body the sex body in a public space is not considered in the same way or on an equal footing as uh, the male body lighting is one part of this but we need to work harder uh, to change the look our society has towards women in the street there are many ways in which you can see gender differences between men and women because as i said at the start luckily enough uh, gender roles are being are becoming more blurry more mixed but nowadays 70 percent of the hours devoted to reproductive tasks are carried out by women they are the ones mostly in charge of these caring tasks and this is very clearly seen in mobility traditional mobility has considered that there are actually two kinds of mobility that's what we see in mobility studies we have mo forced or compulsory mobility and non-compulsory or secondary mobility and what is according to this uh, to these studies uh, obliged mobility going to work to pay jobs or going to universities and it's not that because there are so many but basically it's because there's many people going to the same place at the same time of the day however the other reasons that makes us move around at least in the eyes of this uh, uh, traditional um, mobility studies are voluntary and for what are the reasons uh, do we move around the city taking a child to school is not a voluntary task you can be taken to prison actually if you don't take your kids to school eating is an obligation as well so therefore going shopping is also compulsory so this clearly gendered look at the issue is very hard to change because these two kinds of mobilities uh, as jane jacob said are s relatively simple i have lots of people here many factories here and well now nowadays with the post-industrial world it's not that clear any longer but we have places locations uh, that uh, attract workers and other locations that issue these workers right it should be more or less similar and uh, more or less simple but this is not as simple as that. That's why it is so important to pay attention to short distances. Ines Sanchez Madariaga did a study in Madrid and she asked in a survey which of these activities, going shopping, leisure, walking, walking with people, visiting others and so on, had to do with caring activities, caring tasks. Well, 25% of non-compulsory mobility was related to caring caring tasks and they are as obligatory as uh, as as paid or employment uh, activities and they were above uh, they were more pri a higher priority than universities that's why i insist so much on short distances being able to walk to places francisca will surely tell us more about that she will tell us about the urban choreographies uh, that francisca talks about again 
If we have unequal territories in terms of distances, when distances to carry out these daily tasks are very big, and if we have uh, people who are mostly in charge of, uh, uh, of caring activities, this leads to a situation that uh, forces more women to work part-time and that leads to other consequences such as lower income, lower pensions and so on. Therefore, our society should do more to become more egalitarian. I will know in, not go into this uh, or into that because Francisca will tell us more about that. What do we want in feminist urban planning. We want to place lives at the center. We want to place people at the center and to create cities that uh, will care for us, will allow us to care for others, will care for the environment and will allow us to care for ourselves and for others. As I was saying, who is carrying out these caring tasks? 84% of the people who look after the elderly are women in Catalonia. Eight out of 10 people who uh, care for a family member are women between 45 and 65 years of age. When our children are old, then we need to look after others. We need to care for others. That means that our possibilities uh, to have paid work are reduced with everything that means. And then there is something else that would have to do with uh, the importance of uh, carrying activities in immigration and the unfair situation and these two global crises, uh, the crisis of the environment and the crisis of uh, caring activities that uh, are is closely linked to immigration because there are so many women who travel from other countries to look after other people when they leave their relatives and um, being cared by others, uh, usually their own families in their countries of origin. Imagine we have a new district. Uh, we have this school here, the kindergarten there, but that's not what we would uh, like to have. We actually should have everything much more integrated within, within a district. This is a scheme that comes from the doctoral thesis of Adriana Chicoletto, who lives in this area of Manresa, actually. And instead of having this scattered city, we could have a more nuclear city that would allow us to have a better, better quality in urban spaces and in the use of time. And this will facilitate uh, looking after ourselves and caring for others. It's also very important to look at the connection between social, urban and territorial scales and to work across the different scales. So whenever we decide uh, something urban uh, that has to do with urban planning, very often it, it has already been decided by a higher spheres of power and we don't have much room to plan what we need in cities. Neutral and universal planning does not exist. Neutrality ignores the social diversity related to uh, uh, gender, origin, social classes, ethnicity, religion, sexual identities uh, and genders, uh, functional diversities. Uh, it's uh, intersectionality. We're not talking about women only. We're talking about women with uh, multiple layers uh, that create our identities. They are not uniform and women are not a group. We are half of the population and men are not a single monolithic group. Gender-based urban planning allows us to make uh, the experiences, perceptions uh, of women more visible. These experiences uh, have been systematically made invisible. They have been ignored. Uh, and we now need to emphasize uh, reproduct reproductive tasks and caring tasks. If a society places a higher value on a kind of work and it values uh, caring activities and reproductive activities, it is giving more importance to women. Therefore, it would be easier for women who so far have not had this role should be able to make a shift because they will now be carrying out an activity that is valued by our society instead of an activity that is uh, neglected by society. 
feminist urbanism aspires to eradicate inequality and to break gender stereotypes, uh, stereotypes that explain what we would like to achieve because we don't want to keep having this man at the center of everything in mankind or we don't want to have men at the top of the pyramid or we would like to have more egalitarian systems between uh, the human Uh, the, the the living beings, not only human beings, and if we only think selfishly, selfishly, the production, the market, what is placed at the top of everything, is supported by nature and by caring activities. And we, if we abuse that, everything will collapse. Therefore, if you don't want to look at this from the perspective of rights and equality, at least think about it in selfish terms, uh, because that would be good for you as well. And this uh, uh, leads us to think about these two elements, eco-dependency and interdependency. Eco-dependency means the understanding that we are part of a world that we have rather destroyed, but we depend on this world anyway. That's why we need to have uh, this conscience that everything is uh, dependable, it's circular and is finite, and we need to really look for this planet, look after this planet. And then interdependency. Um, beyond this idea of men who can do things by themselves and everything uh, happens by themselves, no, that's not true. Human beings need caring since we are born and we have uh, a material and also effective caring activities so l recognizing our interdependence would be one step towards creating fairer and more egalitarian cities and what would be the principles of feminist or urbanism that aspires to this social transformation and to eradicate gender stereotypes and inequalities we need to uh, make a, 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 an in-depth analysis of reality. We need to look at others. We need to see everyone. We should not think that everyone is like us. We need to understand that other people live differently and that uh, the diverse population which inhabit our districts uh, need different things. We also need to prioritize uh, daily experiences and diversity of people. Proximity as a, uh, an urban quality. We need to place value in reproductive tasks and in caring tasks as well. And we need to pay more importance uh, to the interrelationship of the different uh, aspects of lives and different spaces because our daily life takes place in different uh, spaces and different uh, times. And depending on what these spaces and times are like and uh, the time it takes to go from one space to the, to the next, the four spheres of our life uh, will be more or less balanced. We also need to recognize uh, Uh, functional diversities and body diversities because uh, our bodies will be different uh, throughout our lifetime and people's bodies are different as well and these should not lead to inequalities in accessing rights as often happens and one more thing we also need to break uh, social hierarchies and the silos between disciplines everyone knows very well about their districts we experts know a lot about uh, many technical things but we are not the only people who are able to understand what a place needs and what uh, the people who live there need thank you thank you very much Saida. you have the floor francisca Does this work now? Yes. Yeah. Saida, thank you. That was a very interesting <laughs> and <laughs> very intensive overlook. And I think many things um, maybe I will repeat in other words. Yeah. And uh, all my experiences I'm going to show you are uh, from the city of Vienna. And um, yeah, so we just want to start. Um, thank you for the invitation. I think it is. Um, very important to talk about the city from the point of view of women because um, as, as Saida already explained many reasons for this I think the most important thing for me is that the city has to fulfill the everyday needs for the everyday life yeah but then maybe men want to ask themselves why should they not also know how to do this? Yeah? Why should extra women think about it? And so I want to start with um, a diagram, oh, if it works. <laughs> oh. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. this one? I have to point to them. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it shows again the relation of movements that, that people in, in the city have to do. And when you look at the first, first um, 
diagram. It's very easy and very simple. It may be is from your home to the working place and to have some entertainment or recreation. So this could be a single man or woman, or it could even be a student or a, a young person a uh, guy still living at, uh, with the parents. The next step is that you already have to do the shopping that you have to take care for uh, everyday life. And then it's getting really complex because then you have a family, you have children, and you also have to take care maybe for parents. So you see that is a very complex system what you have to fulfill every day. And as Saida already explained, what can help you to fulfill all this is to have very short ways. So the society is somehow divided in caretakers and caregivers. I don't know the Spanish, uh, Spanish expression for this, but I hope you can understand what it means. Um, so what can, can help the city to make short ways? It is important that you have a good mixture. A mixture of functions, a mixture of different sorts of investors and social structures, a mixture of different ages and generations, mix of different types of velocity and traffic, and mix of determined and undetermined space which nowadays is the most difficult, actually, <laughs> because everything <laughs> tends to be determined somehow. Um, the most important element in, this, in the city is the street and the places. So when you look at the... I think I, I moved back a little bit here, then, not to turn the back side to, <laughs> to you, but also I, to see what I'm talking about. So you see, the, like a, a street around 1900, uh, it's typical Viennese street, but it's maybe also similar to Barcelona or to Manresa, that the houses were built by private investors and they want to show their own status uh, represented in the houses. And what is important for me is that the ground floor is four meter high. That means that nowadays we can use the ground floor for different things. We can have mixed use, we can have shops, we can have offices. This is a question of building regulations. Yeah? And then the, the, the other floors are for housing and living. Around 2000, the, city, the street looks a little different. There are still some ground floor elements which are higher when they provide already shops, but they're also sometimes very low because the investors try to get as many layers as possible in, in these buildings. Yeah? So if there is no regulation for the ground floor management, then it's very difficult to make a, a changement later or you can change the use of this. Why is the street so important and the ground floor? The ground floor is vivid and it is, um, is, a, is a space uh, for women where you also can, you, you have a kind of safety. Um, and uh, safety itself, as we already heard, is a very important element in the city. Um, to integrate uh, different uh, kinds of, of people and different interests, the city of Vienna is a very, very, um, how should I say, it, it, she, for, for her it's very important to have this mixture in, in the city. And what, um, what this especially means is the social housing elements. So the social housing is a subsidized and supported housing and uh, it is mixed and distributed in the, uh, in the whole city, and it is not just centered on, uh, on the periphery, but it is really distributed around. And why they want to have this is because they want to avoid a kind of ghetto. So when you give the address of your housing, where you live, nobody can tell if you are in the in the expensive districts, or if you are on the periphery, or if you are over the, uh, on the other side of the Danube or in the south of the city. Um, th and this is important because you need different sorts of investors. Um, on the next step, this is the big scale, so on the, on the scale of the quartier or neighborhood, um, how can the building uh, form the public space? As we heard, the public space is very important for the everyday life and how you feel in this space. Who is responsible for this uh, space and who, who is also formed uh, and invited by this space? Um, 
Vienna has a long tradition of social housing. I come back to the social housing because this is actually the project that I want to show to you. And you see that um, the kind of perimeter blocks which form the, the old city are taken in on the same idea, but they widened up to very big green courtyards. And the, the need of the women is already included there because they had common kitchen, they had common washrooms, and of course they had kindergarten. And all these, the, sorry, and all these courtyards are, are very well kept and controlled by the inhabitants. This is the next example, this George Washington Hof, which is already opened up more wide and more, has more green. The uh, interesting is uh, that they are lower houses because the Karl Marxhof, as you see, is, has it, I think, six or seven floors. So this is more the idea of the garden city. Um, this all changed after the war, and in the 60s it became uh, more fashionable, and the perimeter blocks are out of... <laughs> out of fashion. So they have all single bars standing on the lawn and the space in between is actually for me is no space. Yeah? It's an anonymous green in between and who has to care for this? Uh, the city has to take care for this and nobody can uh, involve himself in, in these areas. So then the next step in the 80s was in high density. It was a Prefabrication was the, the experience to make it very dense, many, many people with uh, affordable living. But then the courtyards um, were, were so, so sm too small for these big uh, buildings and you have no side contact anymore. Nobody can control this space. So it became really kind of dangerous and um, this system did not work. And for me, the worst example, which actually internationally is always <laughs> very appreciated, is these six towers of Alt Erla, where the people, uh, there are 10,000 people living in these six towers, and uh, they have uh, apartments which are, um, oh, sorry, are orientated always only to one side. In the middle is a corridor, like in the hotel, and the People go into their apartments there. They have a central area inside, yeah, which makes a kind of urban street, but outside there is no contribution to the city at all. Yeah? It's just nothing outside. And you see that the, the area in between, nobody controls it, nobody looks at it. It is really, for some time, it was really dangerous to go there. So, because the, the situation in Vienna was very unsatisfying, uh, the, the Department of Women Affairs, as um, Saida already mentioned, Eva Keil, uh, started a competition where women architects were invited. And the first diagram I, sh I showed you was uh, the research out of, um, for this uh, project um, with, with, the, with the definition of how many ways everybody has to do um, every day and the short ways that they wanted to, to provide. Um, we, we got a site on the corner of Floridsdorf. This is a district in the north of Vienna. And you can see there are little houses on, on the north side and the main street in the south. So my idea was to integrate the, the existing um, inhabitants and to give to offer them the chance to, to be connected to the to the threat to the public traffic. So this was the, the basic idea of the project to make to make a, a pathway. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> to make a pathway in the middle. This is the pointer, which is a semi-public area, and the really public sites on the outside, and the house itself uh, presents something very open and inviting to the street. The street is a room, a community room by agreement. That means what is allowed on the street, this is what can happen. Yeah? And that means that the people who live there are responsible for this area. And to be responsible, they have to have some contact, some connection. And they also can um, give, give something to the street to the, and to the city. Along this main way, main path where they collected all the entrances to the houses, so there are many 
movements, concentrated movements every day, and uh, you can uh, have unintentional meetings, and so you get to know the neighbors. Because what also is a problem for all these new areas is that at the same time, 500 people move in and they don't know each other. Yeah? And how can you help them to, to, to get into contact just by chance? And there is the, the, the space yeah? can, can offer the possibility or, or, it, or it can hinder it. So this is then the, the walkway. The, the project was then divided on four architects. On the right side, you can see the, the part of um, Gisela Potreka, and these open corridors help to, to show the people who live there and to get to know each other. Uh, on the ground floor plan, you can see the mixture of functions as far as it was possible in this project. That means along the main street, we can have the shops. And in the middle of this project is the kindergarten. And the idea of this um, pathway is that it starts with a, a place, a little square, then the pathway, and then a kind of village green, and you can go out to the neighbors. And here you have the private uh, gardens and green, where there are the playground for the small children. Grete uh, Schütte-Lihotzki was at this time very involved in the project. She was in the jury, and uh, she um, pushed the kindergarten a little bit forward because in my, my master plan it was on, on, on the green, village green and she pushed it like on the way to the public transport. So that means when you bring the children to the kindergarten on the way to, to go to your work. What is also important is that we have very transparent passageways so that we always have the chance to look into it. That it's all try to have a lot of controlled space, unintentional controlled space, the village green. And what is very important for me is the differentiation of different kind of spaces. So there is a hierarchy of space from the total public to the semi-public to the semi-private and the totally private space. And a, a last um, sentence, what you said about Jane Jacobs. It is very important that uh, the, the space, the public space, can be controlled by the people who live there and that they should take um, interest in what is going on on the street. Um, this rather linear and kind of perimeter block now followed in, in the 90s, it was, is much, was much more fashionable to have a total free form, like this uh, example of the Kabelwerk, which I think is a little bit difficult to have an orientation. And now this is the, one of the last projects which is going on in Vienna, the Nordbahnviertel, which I think is actually a very interesting uh, new, new town. But what I think is also difficult is that the street, yeah, when it is not closed and is open to one side, which is very good for the central green, but at night is not very comfortable to come home. Yeah. And you see, this is a, sometimes they try to have, of course, higher ground floor spaces. And what is now <laughs> published everywhere is the Seestadt Aspen. This was the idea that uh, the city builds the metro first to the periphery so that it has a good connection to the center, but, uh, and then is going to develop the, the, the city. What I cannot understand is that the middle of the city, that's why it's called Lake Town, yeah, is, is, a, is a sea, it's a lake. So actually it's a hole for me. It's not the concentration nowadays when the water is getting less and less. It is really a problem. But I hope still, uh, I mean, they really try to develop this and it has to take 10, 20, 30 years to become a real urban atmosphere. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Com heu vist, hem vist la, la teoria i hem vist la pràctica amb el projecte que, disculpeu, que abans no l'he... Aquest projecte que ens ha explicat la Francisca, que es diu, i no ho diré bé tampoc, 
Frau am Verstadt, que vol dir treball, dones i ciutat, en aquest exemple. Sí, eh? Not very perfect, but I'm doing my best. I així hem vist, no?, de la teoria, com tot això, no?, que tot és més eteri, de principis, etcètera, com passa sent, doncs, l'exemple d'un barri, no?, pensat en totes aquestes capes que dèiem abans. Hi ha un micròfon per aquí, perquè si algú té la voluntat o té interès en fer alguna pregunta, és obert, per si han quedat dubtes, etcètera. Jo no us veig gaire, perquè tinc un foc aquí davant. Per tant, si hi ha algú... Bones. Volia preguntar pel tema dels colors, perquè molts cops a l'arquitectura, als carrers i tot, hi ha molt gris, a vegades sí que s'intenta fer alguna rodoneta, algun coloret. Com s'aplica per fer més amable la ciutat, en aquest sentit, amb els colors? Perquè és un tema que a vegades no tractem gaire, però és veritat que sempre pensem en una ciutat i pensem en el gris, quatre arbres i poca cosa més. I al final, visualment, anímicament, els colors importen moltíssim. Llavors, és una mica l'arquitectura, si estan una mica més a treballar aquest aspecte, si encara està una mica a banda o com va el tema? Ui, l'arquitectura és una pregunta complicada, eh? Sí que és molt genèrica. No, jo diria que sí, que tens raó, que hi ha una com una mirada des de l'arquitectura dels arquitectes que mira això, tot negre, blanc, gris, no? Però quan fas treball amb la població, en realitat surten els colors. A la gent li agrada uns materials més càlids, no el formigó, que potser no s'agrada als arquitectes, se s'agrada el color. La meva experiència és en una plaça a Santa Coloma que vam fer un codisseny amb nens i nenes d'una escola, la plaça està plena de color perquè parlava amb els arquitectes, segurament no ens haguessin atrevit a fer-ho així si no hagués estat la participació dels nens i les nenes. Tot té un camí marcat en colors, té arbres amb flors de colors, que també anem a mirar, les làmpades són de color, té un mural de color, o sigui, hi ha molt color. I jo crec que és totalment cert, se fa molt més amable i més proper i sents més teu, però crec que ahí està... Jo crec que algunes de les obres que mostra Francisca sí que tenen color, però que ja que estan apropar-se més a el que a la gent li agrada i ens fa sentir bé a tots, i no solament fer aquesta blanc i negre, que en realitat mai ha estat blanc i negre l'arquitectura, la vida no és blanca i negre. No sé si tu vols... If you have seen on the walkway, maybe you remember we had an artist project involved and on the walkway there were these circles of colors to add color, but I think for me it's much more important that you add some green, because the colors you still, I think is a very individual question. I would prefer that people then who live there, that they bring the color in it If you give uh, some color in big uh, agglomerations, of course, we have to decide before, but I think uh, um, I'm not so... I, I have nothing against white. I don't think I have anything Albert, I think we share the importance that the city has a green, and that this is the part of the sustainable, the circular, and that we are part of this system, not that the city is in control of nature, which is very archaic al pensament, i com no és contra la natura, tampoc és en contra el ciutadà, per tant, és a dir, aquest punt de participar i escoltar-nos, però el blanc també està bé, no? Per fer la barreja, que també seria molt estudiant. També va a cultura, jo vaig estudiar a Escòcia, i com que és molt gris, en allà sí que les plantes baixes són cada una, a Glasgow, per exemple, les plantes baixes són pintades de colors ben estudiants, una lila, l'altra vermell, però amb la grisor que hi ha allà, la veritat s'agreix. A Viena també, no? Hi ha molt color, molt taronja, a Viena. Yeah, yeah, so I didn't really realize this before, but actually I have built three houses and they all have this red color, this reddish color, because I thought it's, that was the red color and it was always the same, so I repeat myself, but uh, I just like this color with it. I would say it's Pompeian red, yeah? <laughs> but the, the city of Vienna says, of course, it's socialistic red, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it has a color, yeah? 
I think it depends also on, on, the, on the industrial products you can have, because on the countryside sometimes, when you have these plastic colors, yeah, now on the facades, this is really awful. And if you do not use the color of the, yeah. of the, um, the old, um, what was is this material? I, I don't know the material. It's, it's Keimfarben, we call it. It's the company of Keim, which actually is a German com company, yeah. and it's made with, with um, not, um, not plaster, but, but it is not, not a plastic color, yeah? Yeah, it's more transparent, and I think that that's, the color is dangerous on a house. Yeah, <laughs> you must really have a good feeling that it looks nice. <laughs> but actually, I agree. If there is more color, but it depends on the color. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, bueno, um, nosotros tenemos un, un petit grupet aquí en Manresa que nos diem Ciutats Mitjanes per la Vida Quotidiana y más o menos también como uh, entrar no, en, 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 en la lectura no, de, de, bueno, de los libros de la Zayda, entre otros, ¿no? Doncs, doncs, en, nos parece pues, que la escala de la Ciutat Mitjana pues, nos permitió observar muchas... Uh, bueno, aquest fenó, bueno, vull dir, que tiene una dimensión que semblava que se ajustaba una mica, fins i tot la propia inserción en el territorio, no? que te permite encara llegir esta inmersión en el entorno natural, en el plan agrícola. O sea, sigui que fins i tot encara te puedes arribar a vincular de una manera muy propera o en el simple carrer amb el, amb el paisaje de l'entorn. Y malgrat tot i això, doncs, aquest primer enamoramiento no? de, de la ciudad mitjana, doncs, també pues, hi, hi observem molts problemas de de segregación, muchas barreras, muchos problemas de movilidad, mucha estratificación social, o sigui, también en los propios equipamientos, etc. Y me ha sobtat molt ver que una ciudad como Viena no? tenía una... esta capacidad de... de integrar, ¿no? de integrar la, la, la diversidad social, etc. No? Sin que eso fuese unas grandes barreras como estarían a París, estarían a Madrid, estarían por todo arreu. Entonces, me agradaría saber, bueno, vull dir, la pregunta no tiene respuesta, pero algunas claus, ¿no? Porque Viena pues, ha estat capaz, si reside en la ciudadanía, si reside en la política, si reside en el propi, la propia forma de la ciudad, ¿no? Que no tiene una jerarquía muy clara, o, o, o bueno, que, ¿quiénes son las claus para que Viena ha pogut Tenía esta virtud. Uh, there is one um, historic situation that, um, from, from my point of view, that Vienna is a centered city. Eh? It has the, the first district as the absolute center, and then it has all these radial um, uh, main streets, which have been little villages before. And so these um, elements grow by themselves in a kind of independence. Yeah? It is not planned, it just came over hundreds of years, yeah? and this helps the, the structure of the city, I think, a lot. Yeah? So it's, it's just going on on this basis. And the other thing is that the Socialist Party is there since 1925, and it's still strong, and it's the only red heart in, in, the, in our Austrian uh, uh, black, <laughs> <laughs> black colored <laughs> country. And uh, the aim is that, uh, as you read on maybe on, on one of these um, examples, that, that the rent, uh, the one thing is that they made a law that the renting yeah, is absolutely safe yeah, in Vienna. It, you cannot get anybody out of this apart his apartment as long as they pay and they don't burn the house. Yeah? So the, the basis of renting yeah, is makes that I think 80% are are rented apartments and not in, in, in not owners. Yeah, this is one thing. And the other thing is that uh, they want to, uh, the the aim in the beginning was that uh, it should be I think 15% of the income. Yeah, should be renting. Now it's about 50% still. Yeah, but we are known that we still are one of the cities in the world with the lowest renting uh, costs. And this is a political wish. Yeah. Sí. No. 
l'accés a l'habitatge, no? Sí. És just to housing. At the moment, the culture is a little bit low. I must confess. I mean, yeah. No, pero ¿por qué también pueden fe a que estas políticas? Porque te, el, el, el asuntamente de, desde que estos en ans propiedad del sol claro. y todo es de renta. O sea, los asuntamientos no ven en el seu sol. Eso es fundamental. Y en realidad, el que es 80% de personas que viven en, en, en casas de renta, tú todo vivo a renta. O sea, no había que esta diferencia, ¿no? Por diferentes tipos y creo que, bueno, fundamental para fe políticas es tener sol. But, uh, Uh, what the city does is they buy the land before, yeah? they buy it, and then they develop the, the land, then they make competitions for the investors. I think you know this, how that works. I don't have to explain. So there are then five to eight uh, investors, they ask an architect, they have to uh, present a project, and the one who has the best project, they will win, and then they can buy the site. So they buy the site after winning. Yeah? And then there is a control if they really built what they offered, <laughs> what sometimes has so 10% more or less. <laughs> and and what, what is the problem that the outside always, yeah, the last thing what you do is the green, yeah? and then there's not enough money, so this is also <laughs> a problem. And the color. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the system that how, how you give site, uh, building sites to the investors. This is. Um, També, si em permeteu, agrair l'Anna, que ens tenim ben coneguda, i la resta de grup, que em sembla que estan per aquí, que fan aquesta reflexió de la ciutat mitjana en la vida quotidiana, que recullen molt del que s'ha parlat avui amb aquesta escala de ciutat mitjana, que pot ser Manresa, pot ser Vic, pot ser Igualada, pot ser Berga, que ens permet aquests no cinc minuts, però una proximitat bastant afable, en què permet molts d'aquests conceptes que parlàvem abans, el que deia l'enamorament que deia l'Anna, de la ciutat mitjana, que sí que veiem aquesta facilitat envers la gran ciutat, que va per criteris més funcionalistes, la ciutat més compacta, però sí que quan som més compactes, però d'escala mitjana, sí que et permet una relació i una vida quotidiana de més bona qualitat, malgrat que hi ha les carències que hi ha i s'ha de seguir sent crítica, però avui aprofito aquí per agrair la feina i la reflexió que es fa des d'aquí. No sé si hi ha alguna altra pregunta, un altre valent. Because you say of the middle-sized cities, the area around Vienna is lower Austria, and they have many, many little-sized cities because the center is Vienna. And in these middle-sized cities, the architects installed, with together with the mayor, a kind of of a small jury. That means that all the projects who are built in this village, or in the small cities, have to pass this jury. And, this, and sometimes they pass, sometimes they don't pass. Yeah? And the jury can give advice what the, the architect should change or what they could make better. And so they have a discussion. But I think this, um, we call it Beirat, Architektur Beirat. Està bé, fem-ho com un jurat, un mínim, per tenir en compte la vida quotidiana. És com un advisor, és un arquitecte advisor, i és una mena de petit jurat, però ells només parlen sobre això, ells no decideixen quin projecte, però ells només parlen sobre això i ho expliquen al públic, també, perquè és un obert, obert, en un altre lloc. And then, if it doesn't pass, then they have to work over the project again, present it next time again. And this has, not all cities, of course, have it, because they, not all cities like it, yeah? It's, it's nasty, it's very nasty. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe 40%, but you can see the difference in the, in the villages. You really can see it. Yeah? So this could be an, a chance to do something <laughs> like this. <laughs> Doncs, si no hi ha més preguntes, agrair l'assistència de tots d'un dijous a aquestes hores. Thank you for coming. S'ha llevat aquest matí a casa seva a Àustria i estem aquestes hores aquí, per tant, s'agraeix, és esgotador, i a tots vosaltres per ser-hi. Merci, gràcies.